This is the Physical Activity Researcher Podcast, a podcast for researchers of sedentary behavior, physical activity, and sports. Join for a relaxed dialogue about research design, practicalities, and, well, anything related to research. Learn from your fellow researchers useful and relevant information that does not fit into formal content and limited space of scientific publications. And here is your host. Welcome, everyone. This is the Meaningful Sport Podcast, and I am your host, Nora Ronkainen. Meaningful Sport is a series of discussions on the why and how involvement in sport and physical activity can be an important part of a life worth living. We will also explore threats to meaningful engagement in sport and movement culture practices and ask questions about what we can learn about the human condition through our involvement in sport. The guests are leading scholars in human and social sciences of sport who share their explorations in a scholarly as well as a personal context. If you are interested in the theme, you might also want to check out MeaningfulSport.com. There you can find podcast show notes, read a blog, and access many resources for further explorations of Meaningful Sport. Today's episode is the second part of our discussion with Professor Gunnar Breivik on Heidegger's philosophy and its application to sport. In the first episode, which I recommend you to check out, we discussed different aspects of Heidegger's thought. We explored what kind of being is the sporting human being. And we explored some of Professor Breivik's recent work where he has developed his own ontology of the sporting human being. In today's episode, we will continue exploring Heidegger's thought about what is authenticity, what does it have to do with being towards death, and how can we use these ideas to understand the sport world of skydiving. We also discuss the value of disruption and discontinuous experiences in sport and life, and discuss discontinuous pedagogy that has been developed within existential thought. We also explore what is time in Heidegger's work. In addition to these things, we will discuss some of the contemporary phenomena in the world of sport and explore what kind of thing is meaning in existential philosophy. Professor Gunnar Breivik is Professor Emeritus in Sports Social Sciences at the Norwegian School of Sport Sciences. His pioneering work in philosophy of sport over several decades has covered a range of areas, including the studies on intentionality, knowledge, skills, and other aspects of human experience and action in sport. Moreover, he has conducted many empirical studies in sport and physical activity, from psychological and sociological perspectives, including studies on personality in high-risk sports. I hope you enjoy today's episode. Yeah, I think this is really making the way towards the work you have done in sport and and your very interesting analysis of of skydiving. So perhaps it's a good good, um, point to introduce that work and you can talk about that background of that as well. Hmm. The reason why why the idea of skydiving as an example uh, came up was uh, because uh, I had done many, many empirical studies of uh, skydiving and skydivers. I even did an experiment with um, colleagues from four different countries. Uh, one friend of mine was a professor at Stanford, Walton T. Roth. Um, he was in Norway, and uh, and uh, he talked about uh, phobias and panic attacks. Uh, that was his uh, special field. And uh, I took a trip up to Trondheim, um, 500 kilometers north from Oslo, because he had a seminar there with some colleagues. And I thought that maybe uh, panic attacks physiologically and maybe also um, mentally show some uh, 
similarity to uh, what's experienced when people do uh, make their first skydives. So I, I went up and talked with him and uh, listened to his very interesting presentation. And I, he he was actually fluent in Norwegian. He had spent a year here and he was a fantastic language uh, learner. So he, he spoke um, fluent Norwegian. Uh, and I said, we let's make an, uh, an experiment with... Um, skydivers and and test them and and see how they react uh, physiologically and also psychologically and set up an experiment and we did that and we compared novices people who did the uh, skydives for the first time with experienced jumpers that had more than thousand jumps um and what you found for, uh, was that uh, your heart rate uh, during the first skydives uh, was 170 beats per minute, which is almost your maximal heart rate. So people sit still in an airplane and just think about what's going to happen. And they don't know what's going to happen, actually, uh, because they have no, don't, never done it before. And when the door opens and you hear the, the, the strong wind and you look into empty space b beyond your feet... It's very scary, scary to to say the least, and mm -hmm. um, and uh, they are actually jumping into the void in a sense because even if there is wind uh, and air when you start to fall, uh, it's sort of experienced as a void, and there is nothing specific there to 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 so to say take a grip on. There is no specific fear, but it's in, it's in indeterminate in a sense so i thought about this actually when when we did the physical experiment uh, the experiment uh, empirical experiment and then when i when i discussed heidegger's being and time i came, came back to the situation of the skydivers moving out into empty space and then i, I started to to uh, develop, so to say, a Heideggerian version of uh, uh, skydiving where you have the possibility of uh, experiencing uh, anxiety and the possibility of death in a, a concrete way. And, um, of course, it's uh, a possibility and uh, nothing more, but, but in this situation, you may also... Uh, become more authentic in the sense that you are actually confronting your own death uh, in a concrete way and you are experiencing anxiety and the void, uh, emptiness, nothingness. And this means that you have the possibility to, so to say, uh, take care of use this concern, as Heidegger talked about in Being and Time, uh, to uh, set up a different life course, to change your life. Uh, it's a situation where it f fits very well with uh, Sloterdijk's famous uh, book title, You Must Change Your Life. Du musst dein Leben ändern. So I think there is a possibility in sports for such life-changing uh, situations and uh, I think Heidegger is the best philosopher actually to, to describe this being unto death and uh, the experience of anxiety and nothingness even if uh, Jaspers have similar thoughts about this uh, uh, grens situation these uh, situations on the border where you have uh, experiences that are quite extreme and uh, also other uh, existentialists have done the same. Heidegger have, has done this, uh, I think, uh, better uh, than any, any other philosopher. Uh, so I found this uh, its very interesting and I was able then to combine my interest in empirical work with, with uh, the analysis of, of Heidegger's uh, situation of uh, being unto death and also personally i've done skydives so i have also personal experience and could so to say try to to look at both 
the empirical part, the other skydivers' experiences, and also on uh, the philosophical part of me, uh, my analysis of Heidegger. So it was also a good situation to, to combine uh, these two sort of interests in my life. I think it's it's really fascinating how you are using this empirical data and then thinking of your own experience and then going to Heidegger's work to kind of philosophize around that. I'm wondering in in Heidegger's thought he's he's saying that kind of falling back to inauthenticity is inevitable, right? Yeah. So so we have these moments of authenticity and moments of being towards death. And mm. then we kind of fall back into our everydayness. Yeah. And uh, you were talking about kind of that there can also be these more long-term changes in how you are leading your life. So maybe you can reflect a little bit on that that tension. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, you're right. I, I discuss also this uh, to some extent in the skydiving uh, article because, of course, the, the skydivers may then, after the first jumps, as they become more proficient and experienced, they are not having uh, these experiences anymore. It's a situation where they are skillfully dealing with falling with 180 kilometers an hour through empty air. They are not feeling the emptiness anymore because it's uh, become sort of as the carpenter's workshop, things hang together. They are able to stabilize on the wind pressure as they fall. They can handle the equipment even in an emergency situation. So they are able to do what they need to do and so on. And that means they fall back on this sort of taking things for uh, sort of uh, uh, everyday situation uh, type of, of, of living, um, they become uh, inauthentic. And and then maybe there must be new situations where they can, so to say, uh, have the experience of uh, uh, being unto death or having situations that put them back on, on the uh, track of uh, authenticity. Uh, and and this is uh, also interesting when it comes to to uh, pedagogics uh, because um, we have discussed uh, a little bit uh, Bolnov's uh, thinking and his pedagogics when I was a student in uh, Tübingen. I uh, followed uh, the lectures of, uh, of of to Bolnov and Bolnov is uh, sort of a disciple disciple of uh, Heidegger mm -hmm. uh, and um, the problem is that uh, also when it comes to pedagogy some of the most important things in life are characterized by this uh, total shifts like being born like like having the first school day becoming married uh, dying these are uh, situations where there is a qualitative shift from one situation to the other and in it and it's similar when it comes to emotions where you can suddenly become very angry or you can fall in love and it's sort of blink of a moment there is a total shift and you can get a new idea suddenly. Uh, you can see something in a picture that you didn't see before, where you also have these shifts. So Bolno is interested in these uh, sudden shifts uh, that are not taken well care of in ordinary pedagogics, where there is sort of an idea of a continuous learning, where you, where you put brick on brick and you build this uh, learning house. Uh, but that's not how life is. Uh, life is full of these uh, sort of shifts. And uh, this means also it's all going back to Heidegger's thinking where he says that, yes, we may have authentic living or moments or insights. We may have situations where we get these glimpses, but we fall back in everydayness. We become like the man, the other, the, the they. Uh, we uh, are not able to, so to say, uh, stay in uh, an authentic uh, attitude and way of living. So 
I th I find this very realistic in in the sense that it uh, fits uh, I think very well with what we see around us. It's very hard to to stay authentic or stay all the time holding things uh, in the right uh, perspective, doing things uh, as we should do, and so on. We are we are vulnerable. We are. Christian belief: We are sinners. We are. It's. It fits very well with. Well, Heidegger was uh, studying theology, was Catholic theology, but it fits very well with uh, Luther's idea of, so to say, daily uh, making up for your sins, praying, and then you fall into sins again, and then you have to make up and and ask for forgiveness. So uh, even if this is a structural similarity. I think, uh, and it, it's uh, it's it's uh, part of Heidegger and uh, Bolnov's uh, sort of basic view on on how life uh, life is. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, we had this seminar a mm. year ago at at Anyho where we talked about Bolno and and discontinuous learning, and and that's something I'm also trying to make sense of in in my work at the moment. So. I think mm. when we talk about uh, pedagogy in, in sport and kind of youth sport and physical education, we are often not paying attention to these kind of spontaneous learning experiences that come through these discontinuities mm. that are emphasized in existential thought. So it's not um, something that is teacher-led or it's it's not something that is kind of... Uh, organized or controlled by the teacher, but in athletes' lives or sport participants' lives, there are all these unexpected crises as well. And, mm. and those might be the times when something new about your being in the world is kind of lit up or revealed. So, yeah. Mm. So, yeah, when, when Heidegger then talks about, uh, you talked about the carpenter and the hammer. So, um, you said about like when the workshop uh, breaks down. So when the hammer goes broken, for example, the world shows up in a different way. Mm. So can you maybe expand on that a little bit? Yeah, these breakdown situations are, are very interesting because when things work well, uh, then we are not uh, aware, so to say, of uh, the hammer as hammer. It's just uh, a piece of equipment functioning functioning well, and we don't need to take care of it. But when it, uh, it something is broken, like the hammer is broken, or when a piece of equipment is missing suddenly, or when we suddenly need to do something different from what we are occupied with, then suddenly we see this, we see this whole structure where things hang together, and we are not able to do what we should do uh, because something went wrong. And it is in, in breakdown situations like, uh, like these situations that we are able to see, so to say, the totality and the meaning. So meaning is uh, uh, most of the time not uh, something that we uh, are uh, aware of in a sort of conscious or deliberate sense, but it's something that simplifies it. But when things break down, uh, the meaning uh, becomes uh, explicit, uh, and I think this is uh, important because uh, if you look at people and how they are living their lives, uh, if you ask them about the meaning, they are it's very hard for them to tell what's the meaning of your life. Ah, that's not so easy. But uh, implicitly, obviously, they have structured their lives in certain ways. They they their lives hang together in a certain way. Uh, and, and Heidegger is, is uh, a very good philosopher when it comes to sort of delving beyond the, the, the surface structures and seeing how, how uh, we function uh, on a level beyond or deeper than the, the, the surface. So... Um, it's it's like Dasein is not so to say the conscious individually individual exploring the world, but it's how Dasein, how human beings function, 
in a context, in a situation, in an environment, together with an environment. Yeah. Mm, yeah. And I think what we didn't talk about yet in, in Heidegger's being in time is the <laughs> latter part, the time structure, and, mm. and how that is fundamental for for the mm. world to show up to us as meaningful. So maybe you can talk a bit about how the past, present, and future mm. kind of work in Heidegger's mm. thought. Mm. Yeah, that's a very important part because it's the future that's really, so to say, structuring the human world, uh, our experience of the world and, and how we live in the world. Because, as Heidegger says, we are also uh, projected towards the future. We are always ahead of ourselves. So he calls this understanding, Verstehen in, in German, and and we are we have all, always this sort of uh, reference point that is directed ahead of us. And by going ahead of us into new projects, the next to do and the next, 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 next to do, we are living ahead. And in order to decide what we want to do and can do, we are flipping back to our past and taking up from our past what is relevant for our future projects. And then we have to realize that in the present. So the structure is uh, being ahead of ourselves into the future by understanding things, going back not as a deliberate move, but implicitly taking up from the past what is relevant and then realizing this in the present. And the past is uh, in, uh, analyzed by Heidegger as uh, that uh, uh, which is, uh, so to say, uh, characterized by always being in a certain mood. We are always uh, in a certain mood. Uh, and that has to do with that we are thrown into the world and we has to be. And we are always tuned in a certain way. Uh, our situation is always characterized by by a certain... Uh, it's like in music. We are, we are also attuned uh, to uh, our own uh, existence. We have a basic mood. Uh, we have we can experience this empirically, or uh, each of us, by by waking up in the morning. We are always in a certain basic mood, not on a conscious level, but a basic stimmung, as the Germans uh, call it. Um, and this is then lived out in our dealing with situations, with being with others, and so on. So, um, so Heidegger, Heidegger's uh, philosophy of time and how we structure time, the existential time in opposition to the clock and the objective time, uh, it's, a, it's a very, very in, uh, interesting but also difficult part of his work in, in being and time. And in sport, I think that we, we, we see that uh, very well because uh, it's sport... Uh, it's characterized all the time by situations that you you need to be ahead of yourself. You need to be, so to say, uh, projected toward the next move, the next what to do. And you use uh, your uh, basic experiences, your uh, mood, your uh, uh, past to deal with what you have to do there and then in the present situation so it's a good sports a very good example it's easy to give good examples of the time structure of, of heidegger and uh, different sports have different time frames in the sense that some sports you need to be far ahead of yourself in other sports you can be very close uh, ahead of yourself depending upon the complexity of the sport and how demanding it is in various ways uh, so, uh, so Heidegger sets up a very good frame for understanding this existential involvement in sporting situations. Yeah, and and you talk about the kind of different projection in sport towards towards what happens next and how you have to be always 
kind of mm. leaping ahead of yourself to anticipate mm. what happens. I think mm. also in the bigger picture in terms of projecting yourself a bit further on in the future, sport is always giving you the goals of the next competition or the next kind of for elite athletes, like when the Olympics were postponed, that was a rupture to their time perspective mm. because a lot of athletes work towards uh, the Olympics for four years. Mm. So that is a confusing situation when you are not sure how you are supposed to be training today because your goal is not where you thought it would be. Mm. We have we have now uh, also a, a very interesting case and with when happen what happens when uh, the sport career is over the the famous norwegian uh, cross country skier petter nortug uh, who um, uh, was a sort of uh, icon he was very famous in norway for many reasons very good skier but also a very special person he stopped skiing two years ago, one and a half year ago, and recently he was caught by driving his car in 168 kilometers an hour, and uh, they found cocaine in his home, and uh, he uh, said that he had, uh, since he gave up his career, he had been uh, uh, involved in partying, drinking, uh, using cocaine, and so on. And and I think the reason the, the reason for his problems is on one hand what I've done a lot of work in personality psychology and he is obviously a high sensation seeker which means that he needs a lot of stimulation and that was what he said that when the career was all over the rush the stimuli the intensity both uh, on the arena and outside the arena uh, it wasn't there anymore. So he needed to, to fill the void with, with something, and he ended then up uh, with in a probably bad way to fill it up, uh, namely with, by, by partying and drinking and, and using cocaine, which means that he, he was sort of not prepared for what was ahead. Uh, you can be ahead of yourself uh, focusing on ne next competition, but it's very hard to, to realistically uh, focus on the emptiness after the career, especially for a person like um, Peter Nortug, which means this interesting sort of short term being ahead of yourself and, and a little bit longer time being ahead of yourself and, and so to say, uh, being relevantly ahead of yourself in a new situation. So I think that was an interesting case. Thanks for joining us this week on Physical Activity Researcher Podcast. If you like the show, make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing or following the show on Twitter. This podcast is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you for your support. If you found value in the show, we would really appreciate a rating on Apple Podcasts or whichever app you use. Or if you would, in a real old school way, simply tell a friend about the show. It would be a great help for us. We have a fantastic lineup of guests for forthcoming episodes, so be sure to tune in. Thank you all for your support and have a great day.